I'd like to talk to you about the Bible as God's revealed truth to man. I'd like us to start in Genesis chapter number 1. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 1. And when God reveals truth or we look at the word revelation, it's the, it's the, dis, it's the disclosure of truth from God to man. So when we read the Bible, we're getting God's revealed truth. And when we read it, it's being revealed what God wants us to know. It's being revealed to us through His written Word. So when we read this Bible, it's God revealing truth to us. We've got to read it, we've got to study it, we've got to meditate it upon it. We must do that. Because without divine revelation... We can't know anything about a divine God. And we're not dealing with human authorship. We're dealing with God as the author, the divine author of a divine book. And He wants to reveal to you and I divine truth. This is a spiritual book. There's nothing you and I can figure out how we got what we've got in our hands except it's from God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll read our first verse. God, help me tell the truth from Your Word. Sir, need it. We ask Your saints to be edified through the proclamation of Your truth. In Jesus' name, Amen. We don't need to get into exhaustive debates with people about, well, I need more evidence that, that God exists. And the reason we don't need to do that is because the first few verses in the Bible, well, let's read it. In the beginning, God. And then we have a list of some things that God does, but you know what we don't have a list of? God trying to prove Himself. God declared that in the beginning, God created. <laughs> he declares to us truth. He proclaims to us, us truth. He reveals to us truth. We are either going to accept that truth or reject that truth. And God forbid that we get into these debates and arguments with people and we allow them to put our God on trial as if our God should even be on trial. Well, I need evidence about this and I need evidence about that and I need evidence about this and you're God this and you're God that. I'll tell you what, stop putting my God on trial because the Bible says in the beginning, God created. God puts man on trial. And there's a difference there that we need to be aware of. God's Word begins with God. Not an, ex an exhaustive list of proofs that He exists. Hebrews 11 and Psalms 19. Hebrews 11 and Psalms 19. Hebrews 11, look at verse number 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. Hebrews 11.6, you must believe that God is. You must believe that he is. Again, we don't have an exhaustive list of proofs. Let's check them all off and then I'll believe. He proclaims truth. His word proclaims truth. You either believe it or don't believe it. Well, you're condemning. Not condemning. We're proclaiming truth. The reason lost people don't like it is because they're already under condemnation. You showing up with your Bible or a gospel track in your hand, all it does is convict their heart to say, well, you're condemning. Sin of unbelief. Sin of unbelief. People don't want to believe God. 
And this book is going to reveal who God is. Psalms 19. We have all the proof we need. Psalms 19. Watch this declaration from God's creation. Psalms 19 verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. You don't need evidential proof. All you have to do is look up and see the declaration of God. And it will declare that He is. You either accept Him or reject Him. You either believe Him or you don't believe Him. I love the... I don't know if you've read some of the, the, you know, the Christian scientists or the Christian scientists that debunk evolutionists and, and all that. It, it's great. I get more out of it as a Christian watching it because I already believe God. So we're coming to it with the presupposition that we've already humbled ourselves before a holy God. But this lost and dying world, look, I'm not saying don't give them evidence, but what I'm saying is if they have a heart and unbelief, it don't matter how much evidence you give them. You, don't, you, you, think, the ev you think the evolutionist doesn't have evidence? They dig up the same rocks in the same dirt and look at the same bones they look at the same sky, they look at the same stars, they read the same book, but because their heart is wicked and because they have a spirit of unbelief, they come out with their own conclusions. You can look up and you can know Psalms, uh, Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Beautiful passage of Scripture. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Look at verse number 9. Isaiah 55. Verse number 9. I believe we talked about this either last Sunday or the Sunday before. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we are finite beings and we think, if we're not careful, that our finite minds can figure out an infinite God. It's not going to happen. I don't care what, your, what someone's college professor scored on his SATs or how many degrees that he has or how many letters he can put after his name. You're still dealing with a finite mind. He cannot fully define or explain or understand an infinite God because God's ways are so much higher than ours. We're dealing, we are, we are, have a body, a mortal body. God is a God of immortality. There's a big gap between us and God. In First Kings, you don't have to turn there, but it says the heaven and heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. That's how big God is. Christianity tries to put God in a box. Uh, carnal Christianity tries to take God and design Him in people's minds that He never wanted to be designed as. God can't be contained. But He revealed truth in His Word. And we should be reading His Word and soaking in all of that truth. <laughs> and as we do that, we're going to grow and learn. Psalms 14, we know the verse, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. That's what the fool said in his heart. But does he believe that there's a God? Let's go to Romans 1. We won't stay there long because we've been going verse by verse through Romans. People are looking for truth. There's no doubt about that. And we want to give them truth. Romans 1 verse number 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold what? Who hold the truth. truth. How do they hold it? 
Do people know that there's a God? They do. They absolutely do. Romans 1.18 tells us they hold the truth in a specific way, in an unrighteous way. <laughs> That's why they will look at God's truth. God made the dirt. God made the rocks. They'll look at that. They'll look at the evidence that they have right in front of them, and they'll just hold it in unrighteousness and come up with the silliest, stupidest idea that man has ever Im uh, imagined. That man evolved from animals. That we came from slime. That's Romans 1.18. You've got the truth and you're holding it in unrighteousness. you got more faith in Charlie Darwin than you do in the God that wrote the book and created the world. Well, that's just a fairy tale. You're going to pay for that thought. Look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. They hold truth. They have truth. God showed it to them. Verse number 20. What's the end of the verse say? So that they are without excuse. That'd be an awful, awful God if He would just condemn somebody because they didn't know. So God says, that's not who I am. I am going to clearly reveal truth to you. It's going to be so clear that you couldn't miss it. Just walk outside and look up. <laughs> and if you deny me, don't blame me. You are with out excuse. And every public school teacher, every college professor, every God-denying atheist, when they're teaching children that they evolved from slime and amoebas and monkeys and animals, and they're going to pay. Because all that little boy or little girl has to do is walk out in their front porch and look up, and they will know that there's a God. You can't deny that. He's the author of truth. They knew God. Romans 2, look at verse number 1. After God goes through all that in Romans, He says in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, He says, Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. We're without excuse. Without excuse. You've got creation. You can look up and see and know there's a God. Look at verse 15 in Romans 2. Bible says, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. <laughs> you know why God says, you know that I'm real, you know that there's a God, you know that my ways and laws are right? Because y'all live down here and you, you, ex you don't excuse or, ex you either accuse or excuse someone down here, I'm going to accuse you of wrong. Mankind does that all the time. I'm accusing you of this. You did wrong to me. Well, how do you know wrong is wrong? How do you know right is right? Because God wrote it in your heart and your conscience and your mind. So don't play this game. You're going to play it down here with man and then you're not going to play it with me, God. Romans 1 settles that real, real clear. People have a rule of right and wrong down here. Where'd that come from? God. <laughs> How do you know right's right and wrong's wrong? Well, we just do. How do you just do? How are you able to put that thought together? Well, we just can. You can't know anything without God. Go to John 18. Uh, John 18. Jesus before Pilate. And Jesus says, uh, go to verse 30. Talks about his kingdom in verse 36. Look at verse 37. Um, he says, everyone, at the end of verse 37, Jesus says this, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. 
If you want truth, you will hear God. If you want truth, you can read this book and come out better for it. Now watch what Pilate says. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? Jesus don't even answer him. It's as if he says, that's a stupid question. I just said to you, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate, you have truth standing right in front of you. Now, Pilate didn't even give Jesus a time to answer anyway. You can have truth smack dab right in front of your face. Young people, you will have a Bible in, on your lap. You will have parents that will read you the Bible and have family devotions at home. You will have a preacher that will say, believe this book, read this book, trust this book. You'll have plenty of Christians that will put truth in front of you all the time. What you going to do with it? <laughs> you know how many kids grew up in church and by the time they're 18, they're ready to just walk away. They've had truth in front of them their whole life. But they never got in the truth. They only did what Pilate did. They stood there like a deer in the headlights and looked at him. And then they asked the stupid question, what is truth? It's right in front of us. God revealed it. This book, God authored, and he puts truth right in front of our nose. Pilate was the governor. He was into politics. A young child asked his dad, he said, Dad, do politicians ever tell the truth? And his father answered, he said, only when they're calling each other liars. <laughs> I thought that one was pretty good. All right, let's go to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter number one. I don't know if my son told me that, and I remember it or not. He's got this joke book, and he, Dad, sit down, I want to read you some jokes. Okay. Uh, that's pretty good. Okay, Isaiah chapter number 1. We have a very reasonable God. And he says in Isaiah 1, the prophet says this. Come now, in verse 18, Isaiah 1, and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as, as wool. God expects us to know that truth exists. And God says, with that, along with that expectation, God says, come on, reason with me. When you're talking to a lost person, reason with them. Don't go out with a, with a spiritual two-by-four looking to just start knocking people out. Now, that, now, I've met some people like that. Reason with them. I remember on Daytona Beach, I was speaking to uh, these two Muslims. And these two Muslims said to me, well, how can we believe the God of Christianity? Y'all don't even have a Bible you agree on. Ouch. <laughs> I said, that, but, but, I mean, that's pretty good. They said, we've got, we've got the Koran. And the Koran is the Koran, and it doesn't change. And we re I reasoned with him. I reasoned with him. He didn't get saved. But you don't go out there and, and, and with your spiritual two by four and start, you know, calling the guy a name or making him, you know, try because, because he stumped you with a question. Now you're going to try to make him feel like a fool. No, you've got to reason with, with that man. You've got to reason with lost people. God says, hey, I'm a reasonable God. Come, let's reason together. Let's talk this through. Let's have a conversation. All right, let's reason together. Isaiah 1, we'll reason together. The lost person says this. Here's some ways that uh, mankind contradicts himself. Have you ever said someone, have you ever said before you were saved, or have you heard someone say to you, well, absolute truth 
doesn't exist. A thought or a phrase like that. Well, absolute truth doesn't exist. Well, man contradicts himself as he says absolute truth doesn't exist. That statement he's making is an absolute truth. Absolute truth doesn't exist. Are you absolutely sure about that? <laughs> he can't be absolutely sure about that because he'd be making an absolute truth statement. How about that? Come, let us reason together. Well, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And all truth is just relative. Let's save the planet and hug trees and worship the creation. But hey, you got your truth, I got mine. All truth is relative. Well, if all truth is relative, that would mean your truth would be relative. That means we can't trust what you say all the time. I wouldn't want to trust that guy either. <laughs> Why? Because he contradicts himself as well. If all truth is relative, then we can't trust your truth. Well, nobody can know for sure what truth is. Okay, that's why we shouldn't listen to anything you say. If nobody can know for sure what truth is, does it really matter what you think or I think? Man contradicts himself. So, if absolute truth can be found, and I believe it can, It's in God's Word. And if I point you to the truth, God's revealed truth, and you point me to the truth, and we all rally around God's truth, we know we can be absolutely sure and absolutely right. Is it going to, have, is it going to cause us to have to dig and study and hear and listen and meditate and go back? And It is. It is. But if we have a standard of truth, it isn't, well, I come, I come here because I like the preacher. Well, that might change in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Roger said, yeah, uh, yeah, Brother Jimmy, I really like it here. I said, well, I said, well that might not happen in another month. <laughs> you might hear something you don't like. <laughs> Amen. 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 You can't, you can't determine truth. Truth doesn't care about your feelings, right? Didn't somebody say that? I mean, that's a true statement. It's got to be based on something. That's why what we have as a basis for pilgrim is God's word is true. And if we settle on that, we can solve a lot of problems because we're not looking to have the, the most likable personality be the guy we listen to or whoever makes me feel good we listen to or whatever other standard we want to use. We've got God's Word. Our basis for biblical absolute authority and truth was found in the beginning God. God absolutely exists because He proclaims that He exists. That's what we believe. That's what Christians believe. And we've got to get our minds wrapped around this. Number two, why do you believe that God absolutely exists? Because God said it. That's why we believe it. Well, that can't be right. That's too simple. Uh, I can tell my wife I love her. And if she trusts me, she'll believe what I said. She can tell me I love you. And if I trust her, I'm going to believe what she said. Why do you believe this Bible is true? Because God said it. I believe it. That's it. That's it. Go look at Genesis 1.
I don't have to analyze or theorize or I just have to believe what God says. Genesis 1, look at, look at verse number 3. The first three words, everybody read it together. And God said, look at verse number six. Let's read that together. The first three words, and God said. Verse number nine, again. And God said. Verse number 11, let's read it. And God said. Verse number 14. And God said. Verse number uh, 20. And God said, verse number 24, I wonder what it's going to be. And God said, verse number 26, and God said, verse number, verse number 29, and God said, I believe it because God said it. What's written in this book? I believe it because God said it. Do you believe in the creation account? I do, because God said it. By the way, that, that phrase, God said, just in the book of Genesis, 28 times. God's trying to get us to pay attention to what He said. Go to Titus chapter number 1. Well, how do you know what God said is right? Because God is absolute truth, that's why. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let's go to the book of Titus. Jesus said in John 14, 17, He said, I'm the Spirit of truth. Titus chapter number 1. Look at verse number 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth. truth, which is after godliness, verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot what? Lie. It's impossible for God to lie. God that cannot lie promised before the world began. How do I know that what God said is right? Because God cannot lie. He promised He would never lie. Hebrews 6 says... It's impossible for God to lie. Talking to a brother earlier, we were talking about, uh, we've been just, church people just hurt you, church people lie to you. Uh, churches have, and, and, and there's, so there's a, there's some damage done there. Man, this church person lied to me. These church leaders lied to me. Right, brother? What do I do? You realize Titus 1 and Hebrews 6 says, that's not God. It's not God. You still use government money. The government lies to us every day. <laughs> we don't throw out the currency. You still use government roads. The government lies to you all the time. A Christian shouldn't lie. Church leaders shouldn't lie. But you've got to look beyond that and say, you know what? God isn't going to lie. I just wasn't in the place that I should have been. Or I was in the place I should have been as an example. But what they do, they just rejected the truth. So what do you got to do? Shake your boots off and move on. But God's not a liar. It's impossible for Him to lie. But it hurts when Christians or church leaders lie. It happens all the time. God help us. I don't ever want to be that church. I don't ever want to be that church. Well, Brother Jimmy, he preached this message and I didn't agree with it. Fine. I can deal with that. Well, Brother Jimmy, he's just too hard on us. He's just too hard on us. He pushed us to do too much. Okay, fine. Brother Jimmy lied to me. I wouldn't want to wake up and step behind a pulpit ever again. I won't be a liar. I'm in the truth. I don't like everything he does. I don't like everything she does. I don't like everything they think. I don't like what that family does. Okay, fine, fine, fine. 
We all got to work through that. We all got to work through it. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want you to lie to me. You know how they picked church leaders in Acts chapter number 6? They wanted men of honest report. If you're not honest, you don't have the basic tenet of Christianity. God's revealed truth. His truth is His Word. All right, let's move on. Go back to Numbers 23. Book of Numbers. If I asked you young people what your favorite book in the Bible is, how many of you would say the book of Numbers? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody would say the book of Numbers. All right, we won't stay here long, but we're going to read a verse. Numbers 23. If you're looking for some interesting names, you can find them in the book of Numbers. All right, Numbers 23, uh, verse number 19. Here's, here's the... Oh, here, okay, here's a good name. If you're looking for names for kids, verse number 18, uh, it says, uh, Hearken unto me, at the end of the verse, Numbers 23, verse 18, Hearken unto me, thou son of Zipper. <laughs> Who would name their child Zipper? Well, somebody did. You might not be able to get away with it nowadays, but anyway, uh, that, that's up for grabs if anybody's in the market for a Z word. Uh, number 19, God is not a man that he should lie. Man lies. God doesn't lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? We as men, mankind, we seek to serve our own personal interests. You go out to buy a car, or you go out to eat, you're looking to serve. It's self-gratification. That's what man does. And when we can't get what we want, what mankind does, sinful mankind, what they do is they start playing both sides against the middle. And this game of deception happens. And untruthfulness happens. And he said, she said. Well, he said, but he meant. Numbers 23 says, that's not God. Somebody might hurt you, but God will never hurt you. Somebody may lie to you, but his word won't lie to you. It, he would it's true. It's true all the time. You just got to search it, search it, love it. Romans 3, let God be true, but every man a liar. Right. We don't always know what's best. What's the old saying? Well, daddy knows. My heavenly daddy knows best. But I don't always know what's best. I've got to get in this book, get God's revealed truth to know what's best. I can't wait till we get in Romans 11. Let's, let's turn there. I'll just read. I want you to read this verse with me because I can't wait to get here and preach on it. We'll be there soon enough. Romans 11, verse number 33. Bible says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the knowledge, of uh, wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That's a beautiful verse that gives us just how expansive God is. Give you this thought, we'll finish up. I don't know if you've seen this. People that don't want you to believe that truth is absolute. Uh, there's, there's the number six that's painted on the ground. So you imagine that. There's a number six painted on the ground. Or you're out on the beach and, and someone came over and they, uh, they, they designed that number six. Or was it a six? Because the picture shows one man standing on one side and then there's another man standing on the other side. It's a six. Unless you're the man standing on the other side and, it, and, and, and so it says, that man says, oh no, it's a nine. 
So what is it? That's the idea, that picture that comes out. Well, is it a six or a nine? And, and so what, what it, it says, just because you are right, it doesn't mean that I am wrong. It's promoting, hey, truth is just relative. It depends on what side of the six you're standing on. Just because you are right, it doesn't mean that I am wrong. You just haven't seen life from my side. Now, there's some application that could be made where, yeah, that's true. In other words, I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you've been through. I'm standing on the other side. So I really, I can't, I can't fully understand that. I might go through something in my life. I share it with you and you can listen but you really can't get a grasp or depth of understanding because you've not stood on this side of it yet. But along with that picture, people are trying to get you to believe truth is an absolute. And we may see things different based on where we stand. But there does remain an absolute truth within that picture. Why? Because there was an author. And every author has an intent. There was an author that came up and wrote whether that was a six or whether that was a nine. And every author has unique intention. Truth doesn't depend on the viewer. And the viewers need to have an opinion. Truth depends on the author. What was the author's intent? And the key to understanding truth is understanding the author. The testimony of the author gives a full and complete revelation. Last verse, I'll read it and we'll be done. 1 John 5. 1 John 5, verse number 6. 1 John 5, verse 6. The Bible says, This is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, it's not one plus one plus one for three gods. It's one times one times one, one God. These three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which He hath testified of His Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. Because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. We've got a record of truth revealed to us. And this book tells you, you believe on the Son, you've got eternal life. You want truth? We've got to build it on the pillar and ground of truth. God's church, He purchased with His blood. And He gave us a book of revealed truth that we need. We need to fall in love with the author because the author has unique intent.